Philippians chapter 2. We left off at verse 13. Okay, fresh review about verse 12. So remember that verse 12, that the passage is referring to that we should fear and tremble. Why? Because we have a maker within us that he is using us. Now, some of the people, they're going to say that uh, you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, they think that it has to do with you getting saved. That's why you should fear and tremble and get saved. But uh, the thing is, it's not talking about fearing and trembling in the sense that you have to work for your salvation. Remember, it says... Uh, it's working out your salvation. So because you already have salvation inside in you, that's the reason why you should tremble and work for the Lord. Now you notice uh, that I separated the two, and I'm not going to expound that. So I already expounded in my last Philippians teaching. So if you have the Lord God Almighty inside you, and that salvation where He bled and died for you, I mean, that's a lot of accountability that you have to show to Him. So you're telling me that there is no fear in that? That's going to, uh, if I were you, I'd repent if I were you. So there's a lot that you should fear the Lord when you have a sacred thing, especially when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saved your soul from hell and He's done so much for you. Now that we understand that because we have salvation in us, that's why we're working out for Him. And that was the next verse, right? The next verse is the explanation to how can you work out your salvation if you were never saved to begin with. Remember that? Remember that you had salvation inside you. So because you have salvation inside you, so you are already saved to begin with. That's the reason why you can work for Him. So it's not working for your salvation. It's because you are saved. That's why you're working. Now, continuing on verse 13 is encouraging. For it is God which worketh in you. Okay, so the reason why you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, uh, with fear and trembling, you have that fear because God's in you. He's working in you. All right, so before you sin, you got to realize this, is that just picture the Lord Jesus Christ bleeding face on the cross and say, you feel like that you can do that after what I did for you? All right, so you're going to think twice. That's the reason why there's a fear element there. There's a fear element there. There's an appreciation for what the Lord has done. Now that we understand that's how it works, because God is inside us and working inside us, then what we should understand after that, let's keep reading, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Because God is working in you. He's working in you where you can both to will and to do His good pleasure. Meaning that He's going to work inside you in some way or form where you do His will and you complete His good pleasure. Now, that should put the fear of God in you, but not only that, it should give a level of deep appreciation. Because it's not of your own. Did you, did you forget Philippians? Go to Philippians 1. Remember that special promise? A lot of times you feel defeated by your sin and by the weakness of your flesh, and you feel like that you haven't done enough for the Lord. But, just look at the passage. Look at Philippians 1. Let me remind you, the Bible says that verse 6, being confident, so verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So in other words, until all the way, till the rapture, I already explained that the day of Christ was referenced to the rapture, that and the judgment seat of Christ. So because of that, wonderful promise of God working in you, He's going to help you complete His will and to please Him. A lot of times you feel like that I'll never please God. Why? Because I've just sinned and messed up quite often. Well, you're in quite good company. Welcome to San Jose Bible Baptist Church. 
It's not a church about all about we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. It's a church that's filled with broken sinners like you and people who don't know any better and who are incredibly stupid and that they just mess up the thousandth time and the only reason why some people might get a free ride to Berkeley and some people might have the job and the blessing that they have is because of God who worked in them all that time and was merciful to them when the thousandth time that you messed up and God shouldn't have never blessed you to begin with. So uh, don't be disheartened, be encouraged by what the Lord can do with you and have faith and just keep serving Him. What's the matter with you? Just get back to work. I mean, either you believe in His promise or you don't. Do you believe in that promise, what it says right there? It says that, uh, for it is God which worketh in you. I know that you're working for the Lord, but guess what? The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own, as uh, one hymn goes. You might say, why is that? Because... Everything that you work for the Lord, sure, it's your work and you're putting in effort, but if it's completely of your own, of your flesh, then God's not going to work in that. Remember, a mankind, they have uh, two natures inside them, and that is uh, the flesh and that is the spirit. You remember that one? So then they have a thing called flesh and spirit. Now, uh, when you're working for the Lord, obviously, that's working in the spiritual nature, right? That's not working for the flesh. The works of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5 shows, are manifest, which are, de which are these, adultery, fornication, idolatry. Uh, the flesh is considered to be dead to you, right? That's Galatians 5 and uh, Rome, uh, excuse me, yeah, Galatians 5. And that is also found at uh, Romans 6 and uh, Romans 7. We understand the flesh is dead to us. So everything that you do in your body, in your flesh, the Lord's not looking at that way. So when you put in an effort from your body, it's where the body is killed in the flesh. It's considered dead to God. But then the Holy Spirit nature, you're doing the works of the Spirit. So meaning then, see, it has to do with God's work. Do you understand that? Why? Because it's all through the Spirit. Now, understanding that's the Holy Spirit that's inside you and doing the work, then that means here, then why are you discouraged that you failed the thousandth time in your sin because the best that you do in your flesh and all of secular, intellectual, psychological counseling methods will always fail you. So if you fail, good. About time you recognize that your flesh is a failure. How long did it take for you to realize that? You better realize that's God that's working in you. Maybe the Lord's going to have you keep failing until you recognize that. Until you recognize that it's the Lord working in you. Until you finally humble yourself and say, Okay, God, I see the seriousness of my way, and I'm going to finally believe in you and trust in you, rather than paying my psychologist, rather than uh, trusting in my pastor, rather than uh, depending on someone else, or, you know, i got to do it because of you, Lord. i, I got to trust in you this time. About time I repent and got right with you. Amen. Well, about time, you know, it... It's about time that you got right with the Lord. It took you forever. Why would it take you forever? It's God that worketh in you. Now with that wonderful promise, be encouraged and serve Him. If you recall, I compared it with Romans 8. Go to Romans 8 now. But let me show you from Romans 8 how this matches all together uh, with Philippians chapter 2 and 1. So remember, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Amen. So in order to please the Lord and to uh, perform the will of God, how it's done is because God will help you. He's going to work in you. Amen. And that's found at Romans 8. It's a promise. Look at Romans chapter 8. Now look at this one. Verse 27. Notice that when we pray... And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth that what is the mind of the Spirit. See that? It's all, remember, the spiritual working. Don't forget that. Understanding that is the spiritual working. Keep reading. Because he maketh what? Intercession for the saints according to the will of God. 
Why? Because we can't pray right at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Infirmities, do that come from the spiritual nature or the fleshly nature? Fleshly nature. So don't depend on your flesh and your weaknesses and infirmities and get a guilt trip. The Holy Spirit will help that out. When He helps you, look at this, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. God knows how incredibly stupid you are that you can't even pray right. That's how stupid you are. Do you realize that? You're so stupid and weak that you can't even pray right. Amen. So God, He already knows how stupid you are. You don't have to tell your pastor how stupid you are, how wicked you are, how sinful you are. I preach that every Sunday. You don't need to tell me and convince me. Amen. Okay? So, God knows how incredibly wicked and stupid you are that you can't even pray right. Now you should be encouraged, okay? Not rather than feeling guilty. Because you should be encouraged that God knows everything about you. Like, everything about you. He even knew the future you're going to mess up the thousandth time. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to help you out. So he's going to even help you in your praying. So then at the next part of verse 26, but the Spirit itself. See, the Spirit again. God working in you, not your flesh. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be other. The last part of verse 27, He maketh intercession according to the what? Will of God. Remember Philippians 2? Both to will. God's the one that worketh in you to follow His will, even in prayer. Even in prayer. But also His good pleasure. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together. Look at this. See, work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. Amen. Verse 28 is so powerful that when you look at that verse, it says all things. So that's even the bad things. Yeah. So even the bad things, Amen. the times that you messed up, the times that you slipped up. Understanding that this is counting the times that you slipped up and messed up, notice that it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. How about that? So even the times that you messed up, God's going to work it out somehow where He can use it for His glory and please Him. Amen. How about that? Verse 28 is a promise that's given to those who are saved. Are you the called of God? Yeah. Because of, remember, go back to Philippians 3, uh, Philippians 2, if you return over there. How is God able to work in you at verse 13? Because of salvation. See, because you are saved. So because you are saved, that's the reason why you don't have to feel bad about your failure in your work. Why? God's the one that worketh in you. All right, he gives you the thousands chant. Now, there are some things you can never take back, okay? So don't get me wrong. There are some things that you can't take back. There are people that I know of who can't uh, return to the past, pastors who can never work for the Lord again in the church after a scandal. I mean, uh, there are plenty of things. So I can, so I acknowledge that. And I realize that, but you got to realize this. That doesn't mean that they're permanently banned and they can't even leave out one track or witness to one soul or that their prayer life is void and God's never going to answer them ever again and they can't read their Bible and catch up in their Bible reading. Didn't you know there are people who messed up their lives and end up in prison for life? Guess what? They can start winning a soul for salvation. Amen. Now look, look uh, God, He's going to work in you no matter what. There are things that, there are some jobs that you lost for the Lord, but not all your jobs. Jo God's just going to move you to a different job, different work to work for Him. Amen. All right, so with that encouragement in mind, now the Calvinists, they use this as their proof text, see? Now with that wonderful promise where you thought you would get encouraged, here comes the dumb, stinking Calvinists. So the dumb, stinking Calvinists, excuse me for being hard on these people, because they... Uh, they teach in a, such heresy that they uh, deny the teaching that man has free choice. So they think in verse 13 that they put this pressure on the people now. The pressure on the people within the Calvinist teaching is that, well, you know, because if you are truly saved to begin with, then you will do good works for the Lord. So if I don't see an amount of good works in your life, then you are not genuinely saved. So see, that puts a le pressure on the Christian wondering, well, uh, I haven't done that much good works actually. So then they get under pressure thinking, well, I haven't done that much good works in my life. 
So maybe that promise doesn't apply to me then. Or worse, I'm not truly saved. How about that? So it becomes that bad. It becomes that bad. So idiots online who try to mock me and then try to elevate Paul Washer, and then these people that act that, that call themselves I am the polite channel and then try to criticize yours truly for kicking Lordship salvation. Now, I ain't going to stop me. I don't care. All right? You just encourage me to keep kicking you. So the more that you... And by the way, thank you for thinking that I must be that popular to you so that you can build up your views. I guess you need me that much. All right? I must be very important to you Calvinists for some weird reason. So then, with idiots like this that you will find out online, that don't stop me. Truth is truth. And I'm going to teach the truth because how many of these ridiculous idiots have discouraged a bunch of people and made them doubt their salvation Amen. and make them lose a wonderful promise right here? That's right. All right? What kind of, a, what kind of wicked preachers who act all beneficial and nice and reverential, but in the end what that does is that it damages people's lives and ruins their souls. I have no respect for that one. Amen. And you can call yourself the polite. I don't think it's polite where you try to dismiss the truth or make fun of the truth. I don't, I don't care, man. All right. Pointer at hand is that these people... So then when you combine verse uh, 12 and 13, it gives an idea about the Calvinist doctrine of tulip, perseverance of the saints, or also called lordship salvation. Meaning that basically that if you are truly saved, then we should see these works in your life. And that it is not of your will and it is not of your own. It is all God who, uh, uh, you know, through His uh, sovereignty, where somehow your free will has no choice in it, and then He does it. So then you get so paranoid then that you wonder, uh, then how do I get saved if I can't put my free choice upon it then? Because there's not an amount of good works that I've done for God, so I must not be saved. But then, I can't do it of my free choice either, because God's the one who picks and chooses who are His elect to get saved. So what do I do? Might as well just panic. That's why there are so many people who get scared after hearing a Paul Washer sermon. That's how he gets like millions of views on that one. You know why? Because it's a scary sermon. It's a shocking thing. False doctrine. It's false doctrine. Period. That's what it is. So, how can people live like that? It's ridiculous. Why do people insist on living like that? And criticize verses that comfort you? I don't get that. I don't get that. How can people be so foolish to subscribe to these channels? Keep watching these Calvinist preachers. John MacArthur, John Piper, and then Ray Comfort foolishly, even though he's not a Calvinist, teaches that heretical doctrine. And then you get other people who get into the, messed up into that heresy. I mean, how dare you? How can you do that to God's wonderful promise to you? Well, in the world, man. I don't get that. All right, so... Let me explain it this way in this verse. So then it seems to show that God's inserting His will. See that? So it's like you're trying to, He's trying to force you to follow His will. But you notice throughout my whole teaching, I never gave uh, a teaching where it had to do with God overrides your will with His will and there's no free choice involved. No, what I encourage you is, is that no matter what free choice you make in the flesh, the Lord can somehow still work it for His glory. Now, that should encourage you because it would discourage you if you think that God's will should override your will and you're still messing up in your sin. Then you're like wondering what's going on, you know? Then uh, you're waiting for some kind of mysterious power or some kind of experience to come over you and then you'll finally get victory over your sin. Then that's a sad life. No, it all depends upon free choice and God... Uh, allows you to have free choice to follow your flesh or your spirit. That's the thing. So yeah, God can insert His will in you, but remember, that's on the spiritual plane here. And you know what they ignored? They ignored the other plane. What is that? Right here. That's what the Calvinists ignored. What the Calvinists ignored is that within this one man, he has two natures. This is God's will, and this is what? His will, the flesh. Right. So what happens is, he has to make a free choice and a decision.
to where he goes. So he has to make a free choice and a free decision to where he goes. The encouraging part for us is that even though we mess up in the will of our flesh, we're not left like that. See that? And then we have so much pressure thinking that, look, in my flesh, I don't see any amount of good works in my life. I don't see any fruit. I'm not doing anything. And then you get really hard on yourself and you're waiting for some kind of mysterious feeling in your flesh where you can do something for the Lord. Now that's a mingling of charismatic experience with some Calvinist mentality which should greatly discourage you. But if you realize that you have a free choice to do this or that, and you also keep in mind that you're not left alone like this, that God's not observing this side, He's instead observing this side right here, mm -hmm. then it should encourage you that, look, I can overcome this. Why? Because I have this side. I just have to yield to this. That's the thing. Right. You have the free choice to reject His will. God can work in you to do His will, but here's the thing. You can reject what He's working and trying to work in you to do for Him. That's all a matter of free choice. Look at Romans 12. People don't read this. Look at Romans 12. Notice that mankind has the free choice to follow the will of God or to reject it. Look at uh, Romans. And we'll look at chapter 12. This doesn't sound like the language of Paul thinking that God's elect, they'll naturally do good works, so then he doesn't even... Why would he beg them? Why would he beg them to do good works for the Lord? If Paul knew that, oh, well, you know, these are God's elect to begin with, so I don't have to beg them. They're going to naturally do the work for the Lord. No, Paul didn't think that way. All right, look at Romans chapter 12. The Bible says at verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. See that? These people, they are to practice. They are to operate and implement the will of God. So remember this, is that Philippians 1, 12 and 13, what it's pointing out is this. It is true God has you do His will and good pleasure, and that operation will be in you. So it is true that He'll do that, but I'm not, I don't teach that He forces it or makes it happen that way, where it overrides your free will. No, you have a choice to go this side or that side. But what I'm pointing out is this. What I'm pointing out is this is irrevocable. This is an operation that uh, cannot be erased. It will always work inside you. But the thing is this. Are you applying it? Are you using it? That's the thing. Are you applying it? Are you using it? That's why verse 12 shows there is a free choice there. Why? You're supposed to fear and tremble when you work it out. See, working in you, that's irrevocable. That's going to go on, all right? That's as Calvinist as I will go, see? God will work to make sure you do His will and to do His good pleasure, but the thing is this, you can resist it the, because you got the flesh side, and you need to let it work it out of you. That's the thing. All right, does that make sense? Now go to verse 14. Verse 14. All right, great verse, and one member of my church always quoted this verse. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Okay, what does that mean? So in life, when you're serving the Lord, what you're supposed to do is that you are not supposed to complain. A lot of people always complain. Amen. That's what murmuring is. And you're not supposed to have disputes, so no fightings. So everything that you do in life, it's not supposed to contain complaining and fighting in all things. In all things. You might say, why is that? The reason why in all things you're not supposed to complain or fight about things is because it has to do with each other at verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine as lights in the world. Alright, I'll explain that a little bit more later because I'm concentrating on verse 14. But the point is this. In context, what verse 14 is pointing out, you've got to not complain and fight. Why? 
because you are the children of God. So the context is with one another so that the lost world don't see you as divisive, as people who are discontent with the Christian life. And isn't that what the news media and higher education is working so hard on in trying to show people frustrated with the Christian life, Christian rules, that they're sad and depressed and miserable, and the news media and higher education schools are working so hard to show these people that they're overtly divisive, that they don't even agree with each other. Wow. See, that's, so that's a bad testimony. Now, of course, there are some things that are inevitable, that there are some bad things that happen that we might talk bad about, and there are some things that we might have to fight to defend right doctrine. If there's a brother in error in sin or in wrong doctrine, we have to fight for that. So all things we have to understand is within context. Because here's another example. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. So let's use our heads here. So all things we're not supposed to complain. So in other words, we're not supposed to complain about sin then? So we're not supposed to complain about wickedness in our world? Here's another thing. Fighting. So in other words, we shouldn't fight for truth. You shouldn't fight to defend your loved one. So obviously there's a context in here. And the 1 Thessalonians 5 will show you where it shows in verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. So in everything are we supposed to thank God? Thank you, Lord, that... And then we thank the Lord about somebody dies and burns in hell. We thank God for murder. We thank God... Come on, maybe if you're a Calvinist, maybe, right? Because everything goes by the will and sovereignty of God and everything should give glory to His name, even evil. And you got to be nuts for thinking that, all right? So, there's obviously in all things with, within context here. The idea is this, is that obviously the apostle is uh, not pointing out like literally every single thing in the world, but it's all things within context. For example, if I say that I clean up everything in the house, that doesn't mean every little thing where, you know, you go behind the refrigerator and then there's dust in there. I mean, there's a ridiculous thing where we went through our apartment management. They want the whole house, whole place cleaned. And I'm like, sure, I got that. But then they put the little detail there, like this little micro dust that's behind underneath the refrigerator. I was like, dude, you're crazy. So notice right here, see that? When people talk about all things and everything... In some other person's mind, or even the person who says that, they have a different, they have a different context here. See that? A better wording would be all things within reason. See that? So all things within reason. So, when we uh, don't murmur about all things and fight about all things, you can't, the problem with Christians and why all things is good is because we always put an exception in there. We always put an exception, well, I have a right to fight with the brother and sister because of this. Or, but, this is why I complain. But, see that? You put an exception there. And that's why you should memorize this verse and put all things in there. All things. And trust me, you're not, within, you're not doing all things within reason when you ha make an exception to complain and fight. When you fight and complain, usually your mind is not reasonable. Amen. So then you have to think and pray about that for a while. Now, how do we do this is following 1 Thessalonians 5. That will be helpful to you. So how is it that I do not fight with uh, the people around me and be gloomy and unhappy and co complain about everything that's going on in the church, in my house, in my life, in school, in work, in my trial? Well, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 again, notice what it shows here. Verse Verse 18, it shows, in everything give thanks, right? But before we go here, notice this matches uh, with verse 16. Rejoice what? Evermore. Evermore. So we're supposed to always rejoice, praise the Lord. Uh, if you look at verse 14, that's the opposite. That's the opposite. Verse 18 is the opposite of verse 14 too. You notice that? Instead of finding something bad, you find something good. You notice that? But a lot of people forget the one in between now, and that's prayer. Verse 17, prayer. Now, this is the steps that you need to implement 
which can be very helpful to you, and that is in order to not, comply, uh, not to complain and fight with others, you need to follow these steps. One, you need to rejoice ever more. See, so that means all the time. So I know that uh, when you go through bad times, it's not easy to rejoice, but that's what a hymn is for. Uh, that's why there are those uh, songs that you sing. Amen. And then don't they encourage you? Amen. That's the reason why you want to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for my salvation. Yeah. And when you do that, when you go hallelujah, amen, glory to God and stuff like that, what happens is it helps you. Yeah. It helps you during the middle of the complaining moments. Alright, you know what gets rid of your complaining moment? I remember that there are some people who went through real bad issues in the home, real bad issues in their life, and this was like right before the day of summer camp. And then when they went to summer camp, automatically they forgot about it. They didn't really concentrate too much on it. You know why? Because what were they doing at summer camp? Rejoice. Ah, they were too busy doing this. <laughs> See that? All right, so try that. Another thing is you need to pray without ceasing. Now notice these three verses are universal as this is universal. So you need to apply these universal practices to this universal thing that you're fighting against. Okay? So you need to rejoice every time so that you don't complain every time. So that you don't fight every time. You need to rejoice every time. You need to pray every time. See, so you need to pray every time and you need to rejoice every time. Now, do you pray? So when you go through a problem, it is so amazing to me people figure out things for themselves rather than praying. And you need to pray every single time. Amen. And what do I mean by every single time? Not just that one time when you pray. When that complaint comes out, see, that one time, that one thing, when the Bible says all things, right? So that one thing and that one incident that you're about to give a complaint, you should have prayed. But you didn't replace it with prayer, did you? You just let it spit out. And then you thought you can put a prayer time separately after that. That's good, brother. Good wisdom. Uh, rejoice, what, evermore. Same thing. Don't complain in all things. So in that one thing when you're about to complain, that one thing you're about to fight, why didn't you re replace it with rejoicing in the Lord? Uh, pray, rejoice, and then give thanks. You know what helps me immensely? Not to look at the bad within my own people, within my own household. I always find something to thank God for them. You try that one. And when you do that, you're going to notice that they are a unique individual Amen. that other individuals are not like. And that you treasure and value because you don't want to lose that person. Alright? So, you got to thank. You got to thank the Lord. And how do you thank the Lord? I mean, you can't... Uh, you, what you got to do is find uh, something good. But the problem is, see, you're always finding something bad. It's, you know why you do these? Because all you see and found were bad things. You know why you do these things? Because you're surrendering the bad things to the Lord and then finding good things. And that makes you happy. That's how you do. So going back to Philippians 2.14, it's one thing where God tells you don't complain and don't fight about everything. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. But how? Right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 goes hand in hand with that one. See, So you want to implement 1 Thessalonians 5 with this. It will be helpful. Verse 15. Following that, you shouldn't fight, you shouldn't complain, because the lost world, like I told you before, they're going to try to find something to crucify Christianity with you. So you have to be a good testimony. So, matching that explanation with word for word in verse 15, I'll explain it. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Okay, meaning that if you don't complain and you don't fight with each other, then you're going to appear without blame in the eyes of the world. They can't find something to blame you about. And you appear harmless to them. You're not violent people. Why? Because the news media, they like to pick one single clip of a preacher yelling about sin, and automatically they say, what a violent person. See, that? if that's their best... <laughs> 
I mean, uh, it's so easy that I can find a BLM rioter going, love, and then, and then just beating up people. What in the world, man? These guys are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Amen. Man, these guys are deluded, man. Amen. Man, they just uh, been brainwashed. Now, so we see here, that's why if you practice without disputing, see that? That fighting? And then without that complaining, you appear harmless to the people. You appear, if you practice these three, you appear like what? These guys are happy. They got something that I don't have. That's a good testimony to the world as the sons of God. Aren't you his children? You're his sons. See, you're his children. So that's why you appear harmless and you're blameless. And it's without rebuke. So notice here that uh, without rebuke meaning that uh, there's no fault in you. They can't rebuke you. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Because in the mid you're living in the middle of a crooked and perverse nation. A wicked, uh, we're living in wicked times in a wicked world. So because we're in the middle of that, we can't let them find blame in us, rebuke us. Now, it says nation singular, but if you uh, like what we see, the Bible interprets its own word. It obviously not means, uh, it doesn't obviously mean one single nation. It's in context within the world. Among whom he shine as lights in the world. Yep. So it's within that context. Amen. Now, uh, notice it says among whom he shine as lights in the world. So you're amongst this wicked world, this dark world, that you're shining as a light. Now, there are several things to look at here. Why would the Bible say singular nation? The reason why is because they belong, it's talking about a spiritual plane here. Notice this is crooked and perverse. You see that? That's obviously spiritual. There's some, crooked means that it's not straight. Okay? So, I'm not straight, but I'm, yeah, crooked. That's what you are, <laughs> these people. You're crooked. That's what it is. You know why San Francisco never has straight streets and they're all crooked? Because they're a crooked nation. That's what it is. I, I always say that. Yeah, triple amen on that one, brother. Okay? Now, if you look at right here, this is the... So, um, but, you know, even though I'm joking, coincidentally, God says right after that, and what? Perverse yep. nation. I think the Lord really mean that. So if you say, I'm not straight, then yeah, that's crooked. And Why? Because God sees you as perverted. You're a big, fat pervert. That's what you are. And that's what the Bible shows right here. That's what the Bible shows. So we see here that a crooked and perverse nation. So God sees as wicked. So that's obviously spiritual. So we see this as a spiritual plane. So... This is the home and the abode of this wicked world. And you can notice right here, it's not that uh, really great compared to your mansion up in heaven. It's just a small little shack right here. But these people, it doesn't matter if it's a broken down shack or, you know, in ruins. It's a crooked and perverse nation. They could care less. They could care less. And we're supposed to shine as lights. Amen. To them. Now look at Deuteronomy. Uh, we're going to look at two passages. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4, and then we're also going to look at uh, uh, Deuteronomy 32. All right, Deuteronomy 32. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, and then uh, we'll also look at 1 Corinthians 4. So, understanding that. 2 Corinthians 4 and Deuteronomy 32, understanding then that if this is referring to a spiritual context, all right, about this, about this nation, right, then it's referring to spiritually the nation. See that? It's referring to spiritually the nation. So, you can find it obvious then. They belong to the devil's nation. That's the idea. The devil's world. So, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Bible points out about Satan at verse 4. In whom the God of this what? World. So, this is Satan. So, that's why they're a crooked, perverse nation. But notice the wording matches. The idea matches with Philippians 2 hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Remember, you're supposed to shine as what? 
light in this wicked dark world. That's the idea. They all match up, the idea. Another one is we look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. We're going to look at Deuteronomy in chapter 32. Now I'm going to give you a little deep doctrine over here uh, uh, combined with the spiritual application. So this might be a neat pointer here. All right, so look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. The wording is pretty similar with Deuteronomy 32, you'll notice. God gave the same instruction to the nation of Israel. Notice at verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. So notice here that what God considers the generation of the people who, uh, that are outside of the children of Israel that the Jews have to fight against, that God calls them perverse and crooked, so they're wicked. But there's something very interesting here. You'll notice here that, uh, one, it's distinguished from your King James Bible, uh, your King James Bible within uh, Philippians 2. This one says generation. Your New Testament says nation. So there's a... They put it as a distinction there, which is very interesting. So why? Because the nation is referring to the spiritual realm of Satan. It's more focused within a spiritual realm. If you notice your Old Testament during that time, the Lord, He's focusing on His own children, and His children is not referring to more spiritual, it's more what? Physical, nationality, right, right there. Right. But anyways, besides that, the interesting part is this. That's not my pointer, though. The idea is similar, nevertheless, about verse 5, that they're distinguished from the devil's crowd, so to speak, or the wicked people. It still doesn't change that fact. But it is very interesting that uh, the children is distinguished from the devil's crowd because this children have what the Bible says, a spot which is not what? Their spot. So notice that the devil's crowd today, that means, right? Today, that means the devil's crowd would have a spot on them spiritually. They got spiritual spots. Uh, look at Jude. That wording is mentioned again at Jude. We're going to look at Jude. And we're going to look at verse 23. Jude 23. There's a distinction here. Our spot is not their spot. We're going to look at Jude 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment. Look at this. Spotted by the flesh. Right? But what is this timeline here? The timeline that we know is referring to verse 18. How that they told you there should be mockers in the what? Last time. Who should walk after their own ungodly lust. This is tribulation epistle. So in the tribulation, these people have a spot. Why do they have a spot? Because there's an animal who has a spot. But the Bible gives it a different name. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And we'll look at verse 1. Revelation 13. And we'll look at verse 1. Why? Because there's an animal right here. And that is a leopard. But the Bible calls it the Antichrist. The beast. The beast right here. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says at verse 2. And the beast, right, which I saw was like unto a what? Leopard. leopard. This beast is called leopard. But then look at uh, this leopard. If you notice his marks, his marks are what? Spots. But everyone receives the mark of the beast at verse 17. 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the bar, uh, excuse, bark, excuse me, had the mark. I was looking at, I was thinking beast, that's right, so bark. <laughs> save he that had the mark. Mark. Or the name of the beast. So notice, mark or the name of the beast. See that? Yeah, I was trying to connect 
a mark with beast here because it says mark or name of the beast, right? So that's why I could put B in there. My bad. But notice that the mark is within the same line within name of the beast. So this is mark of the beast. All right, the beast is a leopard. What is the mark of a leopard? It is right here, a spot. It is a spot. So the leopard, so the mark of the beast is a spot. So guess what? If we look at Philippians 2, Paul took it from Deuteronomy 32. He was trying to point out a same idea here. He was pointing out a same idea here that, yeah, it's the same thing like the Jews went through that what we Christians are going through is within a crooked and perverse nation that their spot is not like our spot. If that's the case, then that means uh, today lost people have that spot spiritually. They have that spot spiritually. Which means then if that's the spot, where's that coming from? That's coming from the devil. The spot of the devil. Or spot of the leopard. Or what? Mark of the what? Beast. So that means then it's very, very possible that every lost soul has the mark of the beast spiritually. See, everyone has the mark of the devil. Everyone has the mark of the devil. Why do you think that God, he has to buy you back from the devil? Redemption and put his mark and seal in there. Ephesians 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. You don't think that God can override the devil's mark? You don't think that God can override the, the Antichrist's mark? The evil one's mark? God can certainly do that with his own mark. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. So no, spiritually he can certainly do that. Spiritually he can certainly do that. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1. And then notice what God says at verse... 7, in whom we have what? Redemption. He bought you back through his what? Blood. Blood. You got a different spot. Right? The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. How about that? Their spot is not our spot. Notice that the Bible follows right here. It has to do with uh, buying back. In verse 11. 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Uh, verse 13, uh, verse 14, 14, which is the what? Earnest of our inheritance. See that? That's a down payment where he made. Until the redemption of the what? Purchase he bought you. But notice verse 13, you have a mark. The last part of verse 13, how do you get that mark? In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed. When you got saved, when you believed on Christ for your salvation, it, over, it overrides the devil's mark. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit a promise. Amen. How about that? So you got sealed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. That ain't a problem with God. God can... Tr and notice that the Bible says that in Philippians 2, you are the sons of God. Amen. And then notice that the Bible calls these people the children, right? The children of the wicked one right here. Right. So they call them the children of the wicked one right here. Right. So then within the children of the wicked one, what did God do? We believe God transformed these children into these children. And I don't understand why you can't believe God can transform from this mark to this mark. Alright, so that's the amazing thing right there. So everyone had the mark of the beast spiritually, so to speak. Now obviously I'm not talking about the same mark of the beast at the tribulation where you have this 666. That one's a physical thing that you have to put on uh, your forehead and in your right hand. That's why you have to do physical means of salvation during the tribulation. It's not, a spirit, it's not all just simply a spiritual transaction. That's why the tribulation saints, they have to resist, right? They have to physically work their salvation. You'll find that in Revelation 14. They kept the commandments and the faith. See that? That's all physical works. But that follows why? Because they rejected the devil's mark. See that? That's how they have to do that. In our case, we had the devil's mark spiritually, 
But then the Lord Jesus, there's nothing we could do in our good works to overcome that. So Jesus, we had to get the mark of Christ. So Christ put his mark. That's why he's got his spots right here. He's got the marks. Five marks to prove I put a down payment on that. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and that you'll dismiss us now with your blessing and help us to keep holding to the promises and not let heretics and heresies steal our promises and our joy. Your word has so many precious promises and uh, they've been replaced by evil. Lord, help us not to reject your wonderful promises. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.